Okay, everybody, welcome um, to our session this afternoon. And um, Jennifer and I, after last week's session, we really thought that it, um, what might be really interesting, which we don't typically do in our webinar, is really to take you through um, our actual methodology. So what is the methodology we use for instruction? So again, welcome, we love having you here. If, you, if you're in a position where you could um, turn your camera on, we love it, we'd love to see faces. And um, again, my name is Dea Ore, and I'm joined with um, for this presentation this week with Jennifer Seaton. Uh, Jennifer is on a new computer, like fresh out of the box. So um, <laughs> we're, we're, we were having a little technical issues already. <laughs> so anyway, welcome everybody. Today's objective is really to take you through and introduce um, and model our empowering writers methodology. So one of the frustrations that we had as teachers, as classroom teachers, and certainly was an issue in my classroom, when I had um, my first year in the classroom, I had 28 students. And um, at that time, I did not have a methodology that um, was what we considered whole class methodology. We would just get kids working and then we'd work in, in small groups. So really what ended up happening is the students were never hearing the same thing at the same time. So what came important to us was how do we guarantee that our students have common language and assured experiences? And the only way that we could really guarantee that was going to be to take a methodology that allowed for whole class instruction. So we're gonna walk you through what that methodology is and then we're gonna actually model a lesson for you. The lesson that we're, we're um, we're gonna do for you is one of the ones that we are gonna teach you today, that we're gonna show you today and you can teach it tomorrow. It's a great lesson, great impact for students. Let's show you, it's one, it's one that's uh, done really well in isolation and really applies to all the genres. So again, let's take a look at that methodology. Again, whole class instruction so that all of my students are hearing the same language. And as always, what we do is the methodology is what we talk about, that those uh, common language and assured experiences. And that common language is critical in order for us to be able to talk to our students in ways in which they can make a difference in their writing. So the first thing that we always do is we introduce and define the skill we're gonna teach. Um, and oftentimes we find published texts for those examples. After we introduce what the skill is and we show examples in literature, the next thing we're gonna do is model that skill. That means that we are talking out loud as the author, asking productive questions, looking for language, thinking about the kind of language authors would use and modeling um, the writing process for our students. That modeling part you will see has a star right there because it is single-handedly the most important part of teaching writing is for us to be able to model the process for students. So we're gonna show you today what that modeling looks like and how critical it is to building language for our students. Most of our students don't come to us with the language that they need for a lot of the work that we're doing. So the modeling allows us to really build that language. After we model it, and we're also gonna model productive questions, the kinds of questions in which we would be asking our students. Now, not all skill work involves um, literally the kids having productive questions to take back to the task but many of them do. After we model, the next part is to go to guided practice, which means if I modeled a segment on elaborative detail and I wrote a descriptive segment about the beach, everybody in my classroom is going to go to their seats and they're gonna practice writing a descriptive segment on the beach. They're not gonna do the forest, they're not gonna do an amusement park. They're, gonna, they're going to go back and do exactly what we just modeled. I'm going to leave all my charts up so that students can see the language and that's the whole point. This is the dress rehearsal. So I wanna make sure that they have the language to take back to their seats. And you'll also notice that with guided practice, we also have added peer conferencing. What happens with our methodology is that as students hear the same language and as they teach that are taught specific skills, they're able to have much more productive uh, conferencing with each other because they know the kinds of questions to ask they're familiar with the skills themselves, and they've seen the vocabulary being developed. So that peer conferencing actually grows in importance because of the methodology. And then finally in time, what we're hoping to see is that the skills we've worked on, we're gonna see application. Now, regardless of the grade level you teach, whether it's kindergarten, all the way up to eighth grade, in our resources, this is the methodology we use. And we always like to remind, really in the very beginning, 
oral always precedes written because if they can't say it, they can't write it. So we're gonna build that kind of background for them as we move through this. So today what we're gonna do is, is slightly different. We're gonna look at student work and I'm gonna ask you to think about this. Let me read this to you. There are many kinds of birds in the rainforest. The birds are really cool. The birds live in the trees. The birds nest in the rainforest. The birds eat plants, eat the plants and insects. Tell me one thing that strikes you in this piece. This is just a paragraph. And I want you to chat that in. Chat that in so that this was your student. I'm gonna read it one more time as you're chatting that in. There are many kinds of birds in the rainforest. The birds are really cool. The birds live in the trees. The birds nest in the rainforest. The birds eat the plants and insects. Repetition, all the sentences start with birds. Repetitive pattern in the sentences. Okay, good. So we, I would agree with you. So a lot of times when we're teaching writing, I think the single most difficult thing to do is to look at student work and provide really concrete, productive feedback that they can run with. So yes, and I agree, they're all simple sentences. Um, not using adjectives. Very good. So now when I look at this, I'm going to focus on the, um, the fact that the student used the word birds over and over and over again. And as I think about that, a really good lesson objective would be to teach students how to use word reference to revise for the purposes of revision. And as they learn how to use a word reference, they're also going to be building interesting word choice and sentence variety. And so the objective of our lesson today is going to be word reference. How do I look at this piece? How do I show students what the weakness is and what can they do to make a change? So if we were to think about our methodology, the very first step of the methodology is step one, is to introduce and define the skill through the use of published examples. In this particular example, I want you to look at this, the life and the legend of, of David Davy Crockett, frontiersman, politician, and defender of the Alamo. Now, right away, what are those words? Frontiersman, politician, defender of the Alamo. And I'm gonna read a little bit of this. Davy Crockett, known as the king of the wild frontier, was an American frontiersman and politician. He was famous as a hunter and an outdoorsman. Later, he served in the US Congress before heading to Texas to fight as a defender of the 1836 Battle of the Alamo, where, is it, where it is believed he was slain with his comrades by the Mexican army. Crockett remains a well-known figure, particularly in Texas. Crockett was larger than life, was a larger than life American folk hero, figure even in his own lifetime. And it can, it can be hard to separate facts from legends when discussing his life. What this is a really good example of is two things. One is in order for, for this particular author to be able to write about Davy Crockett, we have to know a lot about him, right? So we have to know about his life in order to be able to refer to him. But in what I look at here, Look at all the ways the author used words that we can use later as a word referent. And he, we can refer to him as this frontiersman, as a politician, as an outdoorsman, an American folk hero, a well-known figure. If I had my students go through and highlight every way in which we can use those words to refer to Davy Crockett before they start to write a piece about him, what they're gonna, what we're helping them with is to remove the word Davy Crockett and find other ways to refer to him. And in doing so, we're revealing the knowledge we have about uh, Davy Crockett. So what we always like to say is it's critical that when we're working with the word reference, that our students have to have a certain amount of background knowledge on the topic. So we would be, we would not just randomly choose this. We would have something in which we, um, we either were learning about, we shared with them, we showed them an example of it. Here's a little video that we, um, that we found online about him um, that we could play for our students as they're learning more information about him. So that's important 
in the process of how do we get kids to start the process because they need to have some knowledge on the topic. So then that's step one. So introduce and define the skill. So I would be showing students what the author did here. And I would probably chart a lot of these and show them how they were developed. Step two is going to be to model the skill. So for today's purpose, we're gonna pick one, we're gonna be talking about birds. And I'm gonna ask Jennifer to take us through the process of what does this look like in our classroom? So for all of you who are watching now, I want you to imagine that Jennifer's taking us into her classroom and we're gonna be the students as she walks us through the process of how do we develop um, word reference for students. So teachers, what you see here on the screen first are some images. And of course we know that's helpful. We looked at an article, we might've looked at a YouTube video. We'll look at some images, take some traits, just look at some of the physical traits. We can look at some of the behavioral traits because that lets us know what do we know about birds, right? On the right-hand side of the screen, you see a T-chart. On the left side, we're going to list adjectives. And on the right side, we're going to list nouns. And so this is kind of the setup for that and really activating that background knowledge and then preparing uh, to begin to use some of those. And so um, now what I need you to do, if you're not already, is go into speaker view so that you can see my classroom. It should be on your screen. Is everybody there? Yes. Speaker view. Very good. So you see that I have word reference listed at the top of the chart. Now on the top line, I'm going to put our focus word and that is a bird. So what, it, what are other words that we could use for bird? Now, as we had before, of course, on the right hand side, we're going to list nouns. And on the left hand side, we'll list our adjectives. So we're coming up with other words, but what I also like about this is that we're focusing too on parts of speech. And so really you get to kind of combine some of that work. So I want you to think of another word for bird. And Daya, if you'll help collect some of sure. these responses for us in the chat box, if you'll just put, what else could we call a bird? And I'm gonna start us off with one. I'm gonna say a bird is a creature I like to see out in my yard. So I'm gonna put that while you're thinking. Animal. We can call a bird an animal. Fowl. A fowl. It is a flyer. flyer. Good. What else could you call it? You're right. Sometimes they can be a pest. Well, that's a good one. I, I never have thought about that. And so what a good point to make when we're talking about connotation. So maybe it could be positive. I see it as a beautiful creature in my yard. You see it as a pest, right? Oh, a bird can also be a symbol. Hmm, a symbol of what? We could name a bird by its species as well, right? So we could say a bird is a type of species, perhaps. Would we put that in the noun area, do you think? Okay. How else might you refer to oh, this? Songster, raptor. A songster. That's a good one. Chick. Raptor. A chick. What do you call one that's just hatched? Um, just hatched right out of its egg. It has the word inside of it. That's right, Katie. It's a hatchling. Fledgling. A fledgling. Excellent. Okay. So what we've done so far is on the right-hand side, we've listed our nouns. We could replace bird in our sentence with a uh, one of these nouns. But to make it even more descript, we could add an adjective to those nouns. Okay, so I already saw some of you are getting ready and you wrote warm blooded. They are warm blooded creatures. How else might you describe <laughs> fierce? Okay, so I mean, some birds are fierce. I think we all have different ideas or concepts of birds. Good. They can be graceful. 
or beautiful. beautiful. What do Feather. they do? Colorful, thanks, Sarah. Could we say they are flying? They're cheerful. They're feisty. Good. Musical. Now you'll notice that whenever there's a lull, which could happen in your classroom where they say, well, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. What I have to do is how would you describe how they look? Oh, they're winged. They're colorful. They're beautiful. How could you describe um, what they do? And then each of those questions can help prompt. And so, of course, teachers coming up with this means that we're going to think of this ahead of time so that we have some of those responses ready to go. And then we can guide the conversation towards some of this, because part of this is about building that vocabulary. So I'm going to pair an adjective with a noun, all right? So I could say this is a, and you can pair it right across or you can pair them however you wish. I could say this is a warm blooded creature. So if I had a sentence about a bird, I could say this warm blooded creature and not necessarily repeat myself. How about this fierce, foul? What do you like about that teachers, huh? That alliteration there? Or I could say this graceful, flyer. Hmm. You pick some that you would put together. In the chat box, show me how you might pair up some of our other ones that you see here. A colorful songster. I like that, Katie. Colorful songster. Oh, a beautiful symbol. Good. Ooh, good. I like that one together. Fierce raptor. Where did I have fierce? Fierce. Top, yeah. There we go. Raptor. Okay. And of course, you know, we know that a raptor and a chick, a fledgling and a full grown bird, those are all different. And so it has to work out in context too. So what I want to do now is I have one of the sentences from our student's paper or paragraph about birds written here at the bottom. Notice it says there are many kinds of birds in the rainforest. If we wanted to replace birds, there are many kinds of, what would you choose? There are many kinds of, let's pick one of our, our words here. There are many kinds of colorful flyers and the rainforest of course has some of those really bright colored birds. So I love that example. Can you find another one? Maybe we would say there are many kinds of graceful hatchlings. There are many kinds of beautiful fowl in the rainforest. All right. So what did we just do together? We listed our nouns. We listed our adjectives. We paired those up. We modeled what that revision looked like. Okay. So let's go into what would happen next in the process. So in our classroom, we would be leaving this hanging for all of the students to see. So the chart that was just, was just generated would stay there. We would have modeled some revision and then we moved to guided practice. So here in guided practice, now what we'll do is revise the rest of the paragraph using word reference from our list. So we did the first one. There are many kinds of colorful flyers in the rainforest. Teachers, I want you to take a try at this, just like we would ask our students to do. We can have them replace the same sentence, the word in the same sentence, and then ask them to go further into the rest of the sentences and replace where they see birds with one of our word reference. 
you'll go ahead and do that now and you can just begin your response in the chat box. So Jennifer, would you do me a favor um, while we're sitting here? Could you read some of those combinations back? Because I'm I'm having a hard time remembering all of them, and I can't see them as well. Oh, absolutely, warm-blooded creature, graceful animal, beautiful symbol, cheerful songster, feisty chick. <laughs> Excellent. You've got the idea, teachers. Good job. So now I'm going to read this paragraph one more time as is, and I'm going to ask Jennifer to select one from the chat. Remember, the only thing that we did was work on the word reference. There are many kinds of birds in the rainforest. The birds are really cool. The birds live in the trees. The birds nest in the rainforest. The birds eat the plants and insects. Now listen to the difference. There are many kinds of birds in the rainforest. These colorful animals are really cool. The beautiful creatures live in the trees. These resourceful fowl make nests in the rainforest. The feisty flyers eat the plants and insects. Good job. So through guided practice, what you're seeing is, does it make a change? Yes. And as you said earlier, um, we do have some very simple sentences. Um, this can push us toward a little further revision. And so now you see what it looks like for students to take that step. We're just talking about incremental steps forward. Did this make a change? Did it improve? Yes, it did. Now, what else can we do? So here's a revised student sample. And what I want you to notice here is that we did use word reference to improve the writing. Um, but I also want you to show that, to show you that there are other ways that we might look at this as well. Notice it says there are many kinds of feathered flyers in the rainforest. The brightly colored winged birdies are really, well, earlier we had cool. But what if we were to replace that with a more specific adjective? What if we said the brightly colored winged birdies are really majestic? Or perhaps we could use interesting or unique or wondrous or beautiful. Also, did you notice that word referent is not just an adjective and a noun? And so we teach the structure with a T-chart, an adjective and a noun. But sometimes we can make a combination that has more than two of those words in it. In the next sentence, notice the avian residents live in the trees 
and nest in the rainforest. We can combine sentences sometimes as well. The birds eat the plants and insects. So this revision did take that to the next level. And we do want to illustrate that while our lesson objective is about working with word reference to improve variety in word choice, we can also see that it prompts, it's kind of like the domino effect, it prompts further revision. When we get to step four of the methodology, our step four, remember, is application. And application comes across in two different ways. So we can apply this to our writing and we can also notice it as a more strategic reader. And so if you'll look there on the left, what you see is that book Tiger. Students were asked to write facts about tigers and you see a similar response in what we had with birds. Tigers have orange and brown stripes. Tigers have penetrating golden eyes. Tigers switch their long tails as they move and so on. And these are really good facts. The student did respond the way that they were told with some facts about tigers. But if we were to put that into a paragraph, of course, we would not want that tigers, 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 tigers. And if we went back to the book Tiger, we see that tigers were called survivors and king of the cats. And so now that I know the moves that authors make, I am more likely to notice this as a reader. If you look at the next example, there in the middle, that's a poem by Shel Silverstein called Homework Machine. And as I begin to read this, I know about word reference, so look what pops out. The homework machine, oh, the homework machine. Most perfect contraption that's ever been seen. What's a homework machine? It's a perfect contraption. See what the author did there? And then on the right, this is an ad for Yukonupa dog food in a magazine. And this author happens to refer to this Bedlington Terrier in four different ways in that one small paragraph. And so you'll begin, your students will begin noticing them all over the place. So that's step four. Remember, let's go through. We did a literature connection to begin with. Now we've wrapped that around after we did step two, modeling, showing, demonstrating thinking, asking questions, having students participate in that thinking. Step three, where students tried it out in guided practice. And a lot of times trying that out with pairs or their table groups to be able to have that conversation continued, just like we continued it as a whole group. And then now that independence, that move of internalizing to get back to this application. So Daya, we have another option, don't we? We do actually. And for those of you who are hub users, would you chat, actually just chat in the box if anybody who is on um, today is a hub user, would you just chat that in? Just say yes, if you use the hub. And you can chat in no if you don't use the hub. Yes, Jennifer, there's always a movement from using it more. It takes a while to make that transition from the book to the hub, but. Um, so one of, the, one of the features, and we're gonna share this with everybody. If you happen to be a hub user and you have our resource online, one of the features in here is what we call a skill power. And the reason why the skill powers are in there is because when we talked about that methodology, one of the things that we said the importance of the methodology was was to be able to have common language and assured experiences. And what the skill power is, is a tool for you as the teacher. It's already created PowerPoint that allows you to use it to guide your instruction. So here's an example. So as with, with um, all of our lessons, we talk about what the procedure is, what our objective is, and the skill power is a kicking off point to introduce our students to that. So um, Jennifer, we actually put the slides up here to show you what that would look like. So as we go through this, this is, this is how this lesson would run. Now, a couple of things for you to note. When we created the skill powers, we created them well, with the um, idea in mind that you would be reading uh, the background information on word reference. So you'll, you'll be filling in these slides with your own knowledge. The, the slides would simply prompt you so you remember all the key points that we want to make. Um, also, just as another aside, is uh, when the pandemic hit 
and everyone was working from home, we actually created another version of the skill power that is a narrated version. So sometimes we, we assign these to students for them to move through it. And the narrator version has our teacher voice on it. This one has no audio because I would use this to guide my own instruction. So back up for the thinking for just a minute and think about that methodology. Think about that we're gonna take them through introducing them to what a word referent is. Um, and here we have, there are many kinds of birds in the rainforest. And notice in this particular skill power, I'm pointing out to students that that first sentence is oftentimes considered the main idea. So this is gonna be about the kinds of birds in the rainforest. And there's that paragraph that we're familiar with. What I'd be saying to my students is, boys and girls, what do you notice about that? And my hope is, is that they're gonna come up and say, I hear the birds, the birds, the birds, the birds over and over again. And we call that the broken record. And then of course, we all have to explain to students what a record is and why we would call it a broken record. So it's a little history lesson wrapped up in this. Um, and then we move on from there and we say, okay, so if we keep hearing the same language over and over again, what do we need to do? How can we help this author? And so that's where we introduce, instead of the word bird, we're gonna use a word referent, a way to refer to a bird. It's nearly synonymous word or phrase to use in place of a keyword. And so then we begin, where do we start? We begin with an alternate noun. Here's our birds and here's the nouns, ways in which we can start to refer to a bird. Fledgling, birdie, macaw, friend, toucan, flyer, jet setter, avian. Now what I want you to notice here is that a macaw and a toucan are actually the species of birds that we talked about a little earlier. The other thing that I wanna say, we happen to be using birds right now and that's okay, but I also want you to think about other lessons that could emerge from this. If I was doing a piece on raptors, my adjectives might be very different. If I'm doing it specifically on macaws, my adjectives might be very different. For this purpose, as we're having a general lesson that we just wanna talk with our audience about, generally ways in which we can refer to birds. Um, if I'm doing a specific species, a lot of those might change along the way. So then after I introduce those nouns, we talk about it. And again, like Jennifer said, oftentimes this is a noun and adjective lesson. And so then we start to list the ways in which we can refer to those birds. Feathered, brightly colored, unforgettable, flapping, nesting, vibrant, flying, winged, beaked, insect eating. And then we can match those to the particular uh, uh, nouns and again, create other ways to use the word bird. As I'm taking my students, my students through this, I'm also gonna say, watch what happens when I take that list and I apply it to the piece. And again, this is the same piece we just did and listen to what this one sounds like. There are many kinds of feathered flyers in the rainforest. These brightly colored winged birdies are really cool. The avian residents live in the trees and nest in the rainforest. The birds feed on plants and insects. And notice that here, I might draw attention to my students, say, boys and girls, do you see that word cool? That's really a general word. That's actually something that I would prefer them not to use as an adjective. Can you tell me some other ways that we can think of to describe something that's cool? And that's where down below you see majestic, interesting, and that's where we would show students how to insert that. I would also take that moment to talk about combining sentences. Then we move on just a little bit more and we take some other categories. So boys and girls, look at ways in which we can refer to cat, domestic feline, popular pet, independent creature, meowing mammal, flowers, appealing blossoms, fragrant delights, gorgeous bouquets, pink daisies, a fly, buzzing pest, disease spreading bug, annoying nuisance, flying insect. Now you can see from these particular categories, there are gonna be times that I'm gonna have an opportunity to teach students a little bit about um, the tone in which we choose, how that can apply. So notice that the fly, the disease spreading bug, well, that is not a very positive way to talk about a fly. So we can start to talk about ways in which we, our word choice will affect um, the tone of our piece. 
So if you happen to be allergic to flowers, you might call them, might not call them appealing blossoms. Um, you might find another way in which to refer to them. So again, just building up the vocabulary and awareness, the ways in which authors use word reference. And again, reminding them that having some knowledge on the topic makes the difference. And then this, this particular skill power ends with the opportunity for practice. So revise these main idea sentences using word reference. If I was gonna do the one deer are a common sight in the forest and on the roadsides, I would have to do adjective and noun of ways to refer to deer. And then there's the cell phone has changed the world. How many ways can we refer to a cell phone? And then we go into the, and the, the last summarizing slide to the skill power. Oh, always revise for word choice and sentence variety. So these skill powers are embedded in the hub throughout the resource with the purposes of helping you introduce the concept and making sure that we're using common language and providing what we call those assured experiences in the instruction. Now, if you don't happen to have the hub, the way in which Jennifer just walked through that methodology, the way that she showed us, how she modeled that, that methodology will apply to all of our lessons. So whenever we talk with teachers and they talk about student weakness or areas in which they, places they need to work on, I think almost always we come back to the methodology and saying, where on the methodology are we, um, are we falling off a bit? And most of the time, teachers release the modeling component too soon. In order for our students to really become um, competent writers, they need to see it take place over and over again. Remember that modeling component is the thought process of the author talking out loud. And so that's really a critical key component to all of the lesson structures that we have. Any questions on that? Say what you said one more time. Where, where's our downfall possibly? Oftentimes, <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> Oftentimes in our instruction, the downfall is in the modeling, is that we don't model enough for kids. So always when we're teaching our students, every new skill is introduced through the concept of that methodology. But that doesn't mean that it's only done once when I teach the skill. So oftentimes, depending upon the complexity of the skill, that modeling might happen over and over again. So if, I, if I'm teaching, um, you know, what does it look like? Why is it important? I might have to, you know, applying those detail generating questions, I might have to model that in five or different, five or six different times before my kids really start to own that skill. Jennifer, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I would say um, in addition to that, you know, a lot of times we're struggling in our classrooms with really bridging reading and writing. We have separate chunks of instruction where we'll teach reading for a course of time, we'll teach writing for a course of time. We don't often make the connection between the two. And what happens with the methodology is because you're starting with literature, a lot of times your writing and your reading lesson start combining a little bit more because you're taking those author's eyes yourself and really planning your lessons around that. And it helps to have that fluid um, movement from one to the next. And that's what truly what we're doing is, you know, we're teaching them to be authors during that writing time, but they're learning from published texts and they're um, reinforcing it's not today we did word reference and we won't come back to that because no lesson is a one and done, especially when we're connecting it with literature. So modeling, making the literature connection, making sure that reading and writing are hand in hand. I think that's an excellent point because it's also about maximizing instructional time, right? How do we make the best of our instructional time? And one of the things that um, we would like to present in another webinar is really exactly that idea is how do I use empowering writer skills with what we, what we do in reading? And oftentimes in our reading um, anthologies that we use or our programs that we use, there is writing embedded in it, but what's missing is direct instruction. So when you look at those lessons in isolation, you say, oh, this isn't bad at all. This is a good lesson. I like it. It's a great assignment. The problem is, is that the instruction isn't embedded with it. So instead what we're doing is assigning the writing to students and so you're setting them off on the task before they ever know exactly how to do it. So a lot of questions come to us oftentimes is, how do I make the most of my reading anthology? How do I make the most of my reading program? How can I make these connections? And there are a lot of connections that can be made with empowering writers 
and your reading and how you can take those lessons or assignments that are in there and embed the much needed direct instruction. So the other point and final point I think that I wanna make with that methodology is one of the cornerstones of empowering writers is we take a look at writing in whatever genre it is and we break it down into discrete skills. And so in order for us to put together an informational piece, a persuasive piece, an argument piece, there are basic foundational skills that go into that type of writing. We take those particular skills and we model them all individually so that students know how to approach it. Without that work, then they're, they're always flying blind. And this is how what I liken it to always. I liken it to my piano in my house. If I have a piano in my house and I, I can't play the piano, but my son plays very well because he's taken lessons and I really would love to play the piano. But the truth is, I don't really want to take lessons. I just want to take play one really good song. So if you came over my house, you I would you I would start playing the piano and you think, wow, she's really talented. So I've said to my uh, my son's uh, piano instructor said to her a few times, I say, hey, I really want to know how to play one song. Could you imagine if she said to me then, you know what, Daya, just play. Here's a song and just play. And if I sat down at the piano and just played for a month, let's say 20 minutes a day, at the end of the month, would I be any better? And the answer to that is no, unless of course I was some sort of musical genius, which I'm not. So I would be no better at the end of the month. What's missing, it, what's missing it in that is the instruction, the discrete direct instruction, teaching skills in isolation and showing me how to put together. If my piano teacher came and I let her teach me some things, she would no doubt start with basic foundational skills, skills in isolation that she would model for me. I would try and eventually over time, the application would become the song. And that's the same thing that we have to think about in writing. And so that's what our methodology does. It gives us an opportunity to give the students the discrete instruction that they need, skills in isolation so that they have the ability to pull it all together. So before we go to that, our last um, Q&A slide, a couple of things that um, we just want to let you know, because um, lots of times in the chat it comes up, um, ways in which we present um, workshops. I will say the one good thing about a pandemic is it makes us think a little differently. And so one of the things that we have developed over time is that we actually have a library of asynchronous courses so that you can actually go into um, our uh, our, our website and look for ways in which you can learn on your own time. And so we have, um, we have our workshops there. They're divided up into uh, courses and we've tried to put them into nice little manageable bites so you don't have to sit and watch the whole thing in, in six hours time. We laid it out in a way in which we thought um, would be most conducive to learning. We also do present on Zoom. So if you happen to be in Australia and you wanna attend a workshop, we do both live Zooms and of course we have the recorded options. Um, and there's our Zoom schedule. These can be found on our website as well. We also do do in-person workshops when, when that's possible. Um, we periodically list some hosted um, opportunities that we have. And, and right now, as you all can well imagine, that we are um, really at the mercy of whatever the numbers are for COVID, whether people are wanting to do it face-to-face -face or not. So uh, we try to be really flexible with that. So the workshops really are um, an opportunity to go through this particular skills that we talk about for all the genres. And we are always working on what's next. So um, some, of the, some of the workshops that we're talking about now is, and that we've created already is really that next step of applying this learning uh, to text and how do we respond to text. Um, constructed response and how do I use what I know as a reader and a writer and apply it to um, that constructed response. So we also have a workshop on that. Um, and then, um, of course, this is an opportunity for all of you. I think we're right at the 530 mark. This is an opportunity for all of you to ask any questions. If you want to unmute yourself and talk to us, please do. Um, there is your or a QR code for your certificate for any of you who want to get a certificate. And I think we are going to put in the chat box uh, the um, URL. There it goes. Thank you. Um, if you cannot access that, um, that QR code. Any questions? Questions about content? Questions about the methodology? 
Also inside the hub, for those of you who have the hub, we have what we call the modeled lessons. The modeled lessons are absolute opportunity to see the methodology in action. So again, if you take a look at any of those model lesson videos, it's a way in which you can sort of see how the lesson moves and how the teacher interacts with students. And the last thing we included here is a little, did you know burst? Um, every once in a while, people chat some questions into um, the chat box that think, oh, you know, we should talk a little bit about that. We should tell them about. So if there's anything that you are thinking about, um, Jennifer, do you have anything off the top of your head that you wanted to tell them that um, about maybe about our website, about our workshops? Um, I just want to make sure everybody understands the, well, the workshops that we just showed. In order to find those, you just go to www.empoweringwriters.com and we have a workshop section. Um, a lot of people will come to our website and they'll click on the teacher toolbox, uh, but uh, we also might be looking for professional development, and that is um, at the bar at the top as well. And there is a question, what is the next webinar? Um, we kind of talk about those week by week. And so something that's been coming up is the reading writing connection, as well as a response to text. So look for those topics to come to the surface and we'll let you know, just like we have every other time on those. And if anybody has a webinar that they are interested in particularly in or have an idea for one, please feel free to chat that in the box. And did you know that in our, we have a whole webinar library for webinars that we did last year. So um, if anybody is looking for some particular uh, topics, we have a whole uh, library of topics. Now, as with everything in education, some things change. So I, I, um, I think that I know we have a hub walkthrough. I think our hub layout has changed a little bit. Um, but there was a lot of really good topics in that um, in that library. And objectively for us, when we do this, our goal is is really twofold is to um, get an opportunity to talk to teachers because we love that. And um, and and also um, an opportunity to show you some of the key features of what we do and how we do it so that you, whether you use empowering writers or not, have a takeaway that you can apply tomorrow. So I would love for you to try this in your class. It, whether you teach science, social studies, you, any of your content areas, you can see how word reference can apply. Um, and I'd love for you to go right back and make that. You can do this lesson in isolation, meaning go right in, pick up what we just did and teach your kids that um, on any topic area that you're working on and look at the difference in their writing when they have other ways to refer to something. So one of our goals always is as teachers is we want you to go back and be able to really um, apply it right away. So Daya and maybe Art, um, in the past, we have put those previous webinars on our YouTube channel. So those are have been there. Where else can we find those? Oh, that's where you can find them. That's there are some are. older ones on our website, but the fastest place to get them is on YouTube. All right. Thank you. And I have to just read out, out what Alex wrote. Just an FYI, I like this FYI. The hub is amazing. My district has a subscription with EW. Lessons are user-friendly and can be shared with kids directly. Oh, thank you for adding that because I, I always forget to say that part of it, that we have the lessons are assignable. Thank you, Rosemary. So as always, we appreciate you coming. Um, we really do get our, our energy from all of our teachers that we work with. And so any feedback, questions, comments, feel free to unmute yourself. We'd love to talk with you. Um, anybody who's implementing, have any questions along the way, please let us know because we're happy to answer those. And one last note I just want to say is that in our conversations with teachers, many of you have expressed um, that it's a challenging time to come back to the classroom because our kids have had um, a fair amount of learning loss, which is one of the reasons why last week's topic was that really on learning loss and what do we do differently? And essentially what we said was, we're not gonna do anything differently. We're gonna take the students through that process, but that is a webinar that is now um, up in, in the recorded, our newest one, which is on learning loss. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>